Good morning. Welcome to Live Oak. My name is Tim Howard, and I am the director of groups here at our church, meaning that I really help facilitate all of our adult small groups, so our home groups that meet off-site throughout the week, as well as our women's groups like Sisters and Seekers, our men's ministries like Men's Morning Breakfast. And I'm so excited to be able to be here with you this morning, continuing on in our Summer in the Psalms sermon series, going through the Song of Ascents. Uh, I, I'm not going to lie to you, I'm a, I'm a little nervous. Every time they ask me to do something like this, I feel like I pulled one over on them. You know, I'm like, really? Me? Are, are you serious? But I, I do believe that God has something very special for us today in the psalm. We're going to be going through chapter 132 uh, in, the, in the Songs of Ascents. And just a quick recap from the weeks in the past, right? The Songs of Ascents, it's Psalms chapter 120 to Psalm chapter 134. And this is like a playlist of songs that the Israelites would sing out loud as they walked through the desert, took this long pilgrimage to uh, Jerusalem to go to the temple. And the reason why they would go to the temple, right, back before the times that Jesus actually came and died on the cross for us, that was like God setting the meeting place. It's almost like me telling you, hey, like I'll see you at Starbucks at three o'clock p.m. It's not that God lived in the temple, but it was the way that his people went to meet with them. And so they would take this very dangerous journey about three times a year to actually go to the temple and even though today we're not pilgrims, right? Like we're, we're not pilgrims in that sense that we're having to take some long journey. I don't know, you might've walked all the way to Live Oak this morning. And if you did, like you took, I guess you did take a pilgrimage, but uh, for us in modern day, it looks a bit different. So how does this apply to us? And there's a tension there. And that's kind of the tension that we are dealing with this morning as we talk about the, the book of Psalms because it's in the Old Testament. I'll tell you a quick story about kind of my relationship with the Old Testament. Growing up, I kind of my first years of uh, coming to know the Lord, coming to, know, to learn about Jesus, I went to a very traditional church where right, the, the, we all wore slacks, there were wooden pews, the, the pastor would come out and put his notes up on this big like wooden podium that looked like the helm of a, of a wooden warship or something. And then, and he would say, hey, we're going to be in the book of Zechariah or the book of Zephaniah. And, and I was like, there's a Zechariah and a Zephaniah. I'm so far behind, right? And, and, but anytime we would enter into the Old Testament, I would be so tempted to immediately check out because that was not the one where Jesus shows up. That's the prequel, right? I didn't want to hear about uh, the, the prequel, but I liked all the stories about Jesus performing miracles and, and all of the stories about uh, the, the church being built and, and everyone being sent out. That was the stuff that I was into. So, so just imagine nine-year-old me just sprawled out wearing a suit in the pew asleep. But I had a friend take me aside and he said one of the most impactful things that has ever been said to me. He said, do you realize that the entire Bible is about Jesus? All the way from Genesis, all the way to Revelation. Every single page is pointing towards him. It's all pointing a certain direction. And at first, I don't know if I believed him, but the more that I've read scripture, the more that I've seen the beauty of God, the more that I realize that it's all about him. And so as we talk about Psalm 132 today, we're actually in the longest of the songs of ascent. It comes in at 18 verses. So in the weeks past, you know, Doug, uh, Mark, Clay, Branson, they all read you their psalm that they were talking about that day beforehand. And today we're gonna be dealing with it in chunks. So kind of consider me your tour guide, right? We're gonna load up on the bus. We're gonna drive through the psalm for a couple verses. We're gonna jump off. We're going to talk about the sights and sounds of, of what we're talking about. But it's not just an aimless trip because there's a destination that we're driving the bus towards today. And if we can get there and if we can get off of the bus and have enough time to really marinate and discuss what this psalm is truly about, it could not only have the power to change the way we view the psalm, but actually have the power to change the way we walk with Jesus. And that's a lofty statement. I've set it up enough. So let's go ahead and jump into verse one. If you, are, uh, if you have a physical Bible, you know, go ahead and turn to the book of Psalms. Just put your Bible in your lap, let it plop open right in the middle. You'll probably hit Psalms. Uh, and if you're on a digital device, please feel free to follow along there as well. Verse one of Psalm 132. Lord, remember David and all his self-denial. That's a short verse right out of the gate, 
right? But w- what is this saying? Well, we, we can see right away that this psalm is about David. And this is actually a psalm where, historically speaking, uh, scholars don't agree on who wrote the psalm. Some people believe that David, King David, you know, the, the, the boy who uh, threw the, the rock at Goliath, hit him in the head, you know, not, not knocked him down, so to speak, more than knocked him down, right? But, uh, and the one who ended up becoming the king of Israel is, is the one who may have wrote this, but some people think it might have been Solomon. Regardless, this psalm is about David, and we're looking at it through those lenses. And so it says, Lord, remember David and all his self-denial. And I want to really zoom in on this phrase right here, self-denial. If you've read the New Testament, you may have seen a phrase like this, right? Like, carry your cross and what? Deny yourself. And what, is, what does that mean, to deny yourself? Well, essentially, what this means is, you're saying, hey, God, I, I want to live my life one way, or I want to deal with this problem in a certain way, but I know the way you're calling me to deal with it, or I know the way you're calling me to go, and I'm going to choose to follow you anyways and trust that you are better. So, so very literally what this is saying, just, I just picture David just right out of the gate, saying, Lord, remember me and all the times I wanted to go one direction, but I know you called me the other way, and I, and I went that way with you. It just shows this vulnerability that David has, that he has this relationship with God where he's able to be honest with him. It's almost as if he's like, God, I know you know my thoughts anyway, so I'm just gonna come right out and and, and say how I feel. Is there anyone in here who would acknowledge that you've either walked through a time that's like this or you've been there? I've certainly been there this last year, I'll be honest with you. My wife and I walked through a series of trials this year that I don't think we've ever dealt with before. We dealt with several deaths in our family, several diagnoses that it was just one of those where you're sitting in the doctor's office and you're like, I, I don't want to hear that. And, wh- and whenever you get news like that or you're having to walk through a season like that, it's very, uh, it, you, I can be so quick, right, to, to say, God, I want to deal with this problem my way. I want to isolate myself. Uh, I, I, I want to uh, go about this in a way that is not the way that you've called me to. But David is right here saying, I've had those thoughts, but I've decided to follow you anyway. So jumping on the bus, we're going to go now through verses two through five. He swore an oath to the Lord. He made a vow to the mighty one of Jacob. I will not enter my house or go to my bed. I will allow no sleep to my eyes or slumber to my eyelids until I find a place for the Lord, a dwelling for the mighty one of Jacob. Now, what, what is this talking about? Well, I want to highlight some key phrases here. He, talking about David, did what? He swore an oath to the Lord. He made a vow. He says, I will not enter my house or go to my bed, and I will allow no sleep to my eyes. Those are very intense statements, right? I've, I've never had someone promise me something and say, hey, I swear an oath to you. And there's something very Lord of the Rings sounding about that, right? Doug, Doug made a joke earlier this week. It almost sounds like David is a CrossFitter. If you're a CrossFitter, there's, I'm, not, I'm not trying to just poke fun at you directly, but, but you guys get very intense. He, he sounds like he's being... He's, he's being very intense in the way that he's approaching something. And what, what is this thing that he's approaching? Until I find a place for the Lord, a dwelling for the mighty one of Jacob. So what David's talking about here is that he's very intense about this idea of building the temple. Because at this point, it had not been built yet. That temple that we were talking about earlier that the Israelites would make a pilgrimage to, David is saying, I want to build a place for us to be able to come and meet with the Lord, a place for his people to be able to come and be in his presence and be able to speak with him. And he is so intense about this that he has to state it about four times how serious he is about God being able to have a dwelling place with his people. Now let's keep on driving. Let's get back on the bus. You ready? All right, verse six through nine. We heard it in Ephrathah, we came upon it in the fields of Jar. Let us go to his dwelling place. Let us worship at his footstool, saying, Arise, Lord, and come to your resting place, you and the ark of your might. May your priest be clothed with your righteousness. May your faithful people sing for joy. Well, the first thing I want to point out is that here in verse 6, we see, we see two words. We see Ephrathah. And we see this word jar. 
If, if you don't know what those are, you're in good company. Whenever I learned that I was going to be giving this message today, I just want to give an encouragement to you that whenever I read this, I said, I don't know what that is. So if you do your at-home Bible reading time throughout the week and you ever come across something that you don't understand, you're in very good company and you shouldn't let that discourage you. I use the tool called a study Bible. I use the NIV study Bible to help me understand this verse right here. Uh, and, and the study Bible is great because it has the Bible, but down at the bottom, it has notes from scholars to help you kind of understand what you're reading, right? And so essentially what this is saying is that they heard a calling in this geographical location called Ephratha, and they came upon something in the fields of Jar. And what they came upon was actually the Ark of the Covenant, right? Have you ever heard of the Ark of the, Co uh, the, Ark of the Covenant? If you've watched Indiana Jones, you might know what that is. Well, spoiler alert, it's not from Indiana Jones originally. It's from the Old Testament originally. And it was this gold box that they would put the Ten Commandments in, that they would carry around. It was God's message to his people. And at some point in history, it had actually been lost from the people of Israel. They no longer had it, but they actually came back in possession of it. So here in verse 8, whenever David says, Arise, Lord, and come to your resting place, you and the ark of your might. It's almost like David is inviting the Lord. He's saying, hey, God, would you, would, you, would you come and be close to your people? Would you please come, just like we came upon the ark of the covenant, and it's now back with your people, would you come and meet with us too? You just see another glimpse of David's heart in that way. So now we're gonna keep on going through the psalm back on the bus. All right, for the sake of your servant David, do not reject your anointed one. The Lord swore an oath to David, a sure oath he will not revoke. One of your own descendants I will place on your throne. If your sons keep my covenant and the statutes I teach them, then their sons will sit on your throne forever and ever. And I, I love this section right here in the Psalms because it's right, right here in verse 11, David is telling the Lord, hey, the Lord swore an oath to David or the Lord swore, swore an oath to me, a sure oath he will not revoke. And it's, it's funny because I just have this picture in my head of David. It's, you know, we saw a couple sections earlier that he was you know, telling God, hey, I made you a promise, God. I made you a promise. I'm gonna build the temple. But he has this relationship with the Lord that's close enough that he can go, hey, 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 but you made a promise to me too. You made a promise to me too, God, and I'm gonna remind you of what that is. He, this is what God told David. One of your own descendants I will place on your throne. If your sons keep my covenant and the statutes I teach them, then their sons will sit on your throne for how long? Forever and ever, right? And so looking at this promise, we can tell that there's going to be the sons of the sons of the sons of David, his, his lineage. God's promising David will sit on the throne of Israel, and at first glance, that's, that's really what we get from this psalm. It doesn't say much else about that promise besides that. But a little bit later on in the Bible, we're going to jump to another section in Scripture. We're going to jump over to the book of Jeremiah. It's a little bit further on in the Old Testament. It was actually written after. But right here in Jeremiah 23, verses 5 through 6, it actually expands upon that promise. It gives us a little more insight into what that promise was about. And here's what it says from the book of Jeremiah. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, a king who will reign wisely and do what is just and right in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved and Israel will live in safety. This is the name by which he will be called. What will he be called? the Lord, our righteous Savior, all capital letters, so a proper name. So what we get from this is we actually learn that it's not going to be just descendants, but there's going to be a descendant who's going to be called the Lord, our righteous Savior, right? He comes from the branch of David. He comes from his family tree who's going to sit on the throne, and he is going to bring his people into safety and reign wisely. Remember earlier how I kind of talked a little bit about how the Old Testament points a certain direction? Let's keep that in mind. Back on the bus in Psalm chapter 132, verse 13, for the Lord has chosen Zion. He has desired it for his dwelling, saying, 
This is my resting place forever and ever. I love these two verses. I love these two verses so much. At first glance, it's kind of like, well, what are they about? Well, I love this because what God is telling his people is he's saying, hey, I've, uh, I've actually chosen you guys. I've actually chosen you as my people. Why? why? How come? I love what it says. He has desired it. I don't know about you, but I think sometimes in my relationship with Jesus, I, I view whenever I got saved as almost kind of a begrudging event. It's almost like I was at that youth camp in the ninth grade and all my friends got saved too. We all committed our lives to Jesus. And it was almost like God drove up in a bus and everyone piled on and there was only like a sliver of a seat left. It wasn't quite a seat. And, and, and God goes, oh man, I'm sorry. It's all filled up. I don't know if we can take you. And then one of the friends scoots over and God's like, I'd be kind of awkward if I said no now. There's one seat left. So I guess, I guess you can come along, man. I guess you can come along. I guess you can follow me. And I know that sounds funny, but if we're honest with ourselves, that's how we view God sometimes, right? Because I know all of my flaws. If I took all of my thoughts that I've had in the last seven days and put them up on this screen, I would be mortified and so would you but so would you all if we did the same thing to you, right? And so oftentimes we have this view of God that he just kind of tolerates us and just kind of lets us come along for the ride. And I love this because oftentimes we just read stuff like this in our Bible reading plans and we just skim right over it, but don't miss what this is saying. He has desired it. He has desired to have a relationship with you. And that's beautiful. Let's jump back on the bus, keep on driving through the psalm. We're finishing up right here. We're almost at the end. I will bless her with abundant provisions. Her poor, I will satisfy with food. I will clothe her priests with salvation and her faithful people will ever sing for joy. Here I will make a horn grow for David and set up a lamp for my anointed one. I will clothe his enemies with shame, but his head will be adorned with a radiant crown. What is this saying? This is essentially God giving a marketing pitch as to why it's so great to be his people, and to be close to him, All right? He says, I'm gonna bless you with abundant provisions. Her poor, I will satisfy with food. So they're gonna have everything they need in a physical sense, as well as their souls are satisfied. He says, I'll clothe her priest with salvation. Her faithful people will ever sing for joy. I will make a horn grow for David, set up a lamp for my anointed one. I'll clothe his enemies with shame, but his head will ever be adorned with a radiant crown. That sounds pretty good, right? I mean, that's, that's a, a pretty good marketing pitch to follow the Lord. I mean, I want to have everything I need. I want to be saved. I want to sing for joy. I want to wear a crown. And so this is God just telling his people, hey, if you follow me, if you come and be my people, this is what you can expect. So just a quick summary of Psalm 132, because I, I feel like I just threw a lot at you. I feel like you're having to drink out of a fire hose this morning. And so let's kind of recap what we just read. We can ask God to be with us during times of pain, and he is right out of the gate. David says, hey, remember me, God. Remember my self-denial. Remember the stuff I had to go through. That was hard. That was tough. God has always had a desire and a plan to be close to us through the temple. He's always desired to be able to come and be with his people. And why is that? Is that because we're so awesome? Well, as we've established, if... I don't know about you, if I were to put my thoughts up on the screen, I would say, I'm not that awesome, right? So it's not that we brought so much to the table, it's just that he is that merciful and kind that he desires to come and be with us. And third thing, God promised to put a king on the throne who was a descendant of David. And so here's a question we're gonna talk about today. Why does any of this matter, right? We could pack up now, right? I could be like, hey, we got to the 18th verse. You guys go on to brunch, go on to Roses, wherever it is you're going after this. Let's call it a day. But there's something so much more in this psalm that if in the context of scripture, that if we just zoom right by it, we're gonna miss in this modern day what is so incredible about it. And a lot of you guys in this room might know where I'm going, but I'm gonna press into it anyways that that promised king came, right? That king that was alluded to in Psalm 132 
talked about in the book of Jeremiah. There's also other places in the Bible, like Isaiah, where it talks about this king. He came, and he entered our world. He was 100% man, but he was also 100% God. He's the creator all the way from Genesis, very literally stepping into our world in the flesh of a human. And he had to live our life and go through the exact same thing that we went through. All of the pain, all the sorrow, the highs and the lows, he experienced it all, but he did it without ever sinning. He never sinned. He never even had a wrong thought. If we put every single one of his thoughts up on the screen, not a single time he would have ever thought something that we would say, wow, that was shameful, right? He lived a perfect life, but in the end, he was punished for all of the things we had done. And he took all of that punishment on the cross, died a death that we cannot even imagine, was buried, but three days later rose again. And he's alive to this day, and he sits on the throne to this day. And we've heard that story. Hopefully you have several times. If you've never heard that story, I'm so glad you're here this morning. But it can become routine for us. And one of the things that I love about the Bible is that it always backs up its own claims or it goes out of its way to. And so whenever it says, hey, that, that king from Psalm 132, he's here now, he's on the scene. It doesn't just claim that he's the king. It, it goes out of its way to show us. So let's take a look. Right out of the gate at the very beginning of the New Testament. This is a lot of verses. Don't worry, I see some of your eyes are like, is he going to read all of that? I'm not reading all of it. But I just want to show you something really cool. I want to show you something so cool. At the very beginning of Matthew, if you've ever read Matthew, you might have just skipped over this part. I did a couple times, I'll admit it, because I don't like the part necessarily where it's the son of so-and-so is the son of so-and-so, is so-and-so's father who's the son of so-and-so. I find that part kind of boring, so I'll just skip it. But what the Bible is saying right here and showing us right here is how there's King David, how he's related to the first person that God gave a promise to, Abraham, right? He, he told Abraham, I'm gonna make your descendants as numerous as the stars. But then it goes on, verse seven through 11, more names, and we get all the way to verse 16. And we arrive at Jesus, who is called the Messiah, showing us, every single step of the way, how we got from that promised king in Psalm 132 that we're talking about to Jesus, who is called the Messiah. So I wanna take a look back at that summary of Psalm 132, but just reword it a little bit. Now that we have that added context that we now live on this side of the cross of Christ, right? That if you are in this room and you claim him as your savior, you get the benefit now of having access to him in an unimpeded way that we weren't able to have before. And so because of Jesus, you no longer have to travel to the temple. We no longer have to go to a building to meet with God. You have access to him. Coming to church on a Sunday morning is great, but that is not necessarily how you have to meet with God anymore because you have access to him. And why is that? Because now you're the temple if you're in Jesus Christ, right? 1 Corinthians 6, 19. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. I've seen this verse so many times and I've always applied it to health-related things, right? I'll say, I can't have that extra piece of pizza. My body's a temple, right? I can't have that extra donut, my body's temple. I'm at the gym, I'm like, my body's a temple. You might not be able to tell that I go to the gym, but I do sometimes, I'm trying. Um, we'll read this verse and we'll glaze right over the most incredible thing that he says, that God is saying here. He says, do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit? That temple that we talked about that all the Israelites would make a pilgrimage to, they would go through the desert, they would walk for days and days and days on this dangerous journey to get to the temple so that they could meet with God. You are now called a temple of the Holy Spirit. The spirit of the almighty one God now lives inside of 
you. And so I want to look back at the summary from Psalm 132, reworded a bit. We can ask God to be with us during times of pain, and he's not just with us. He's not just floating above our problems. Why? Because he went into the muck and mire of our problems too. Jesus understands. He understands where you're at. He empathizes with where you're at, and that Holy Spirit of Jesus now lives in you. God has always desired to be close to us, but he didn't just desire to be close to us. He made a way. He sent his son to come and live the perfect life that we couldn't live and be punished for the things that were ours to be punished for. But because of that, we now have access to him. And so third, the promised king has come and his promise is offered to you. The promised king from Psalm 132 has come and his promise to sit on the throne forever and ever and bring safety to his people, to bring salvation to his people, to bring joy to his people is now offered to you. If you are in Christ, it is not just a get into heaven ticket free card. It applies to you on this side of heaven as well. Your life matters. I'm gonna speak directly to you in this room if you're a Christian for just a second. If you would claim Jesus Christ as your savior, I'm gonna speak directly to you. If you're in a place in your life right now, and I, and I get being there because I can often get there too, where you see your life as not super meaningful. You show up at your job, you wait till you clock out, you leave. You don't feel like maybe you're adding much to your family. If you were honest with yourself, you feel like your life is in the neutral gear. You don't feel like you bring much to the table, but you are in Christ. That is the biggest lie that you could believe because what's actually true is that you are a temple of the Holy Spirit. That temple that the Israelites would travel to, you are now taking with you everywhere you go because you are a temple of the Holy Spirit filled with the Spirit of God. So whenever you're with your coworkers, you're with your family, you're with your children, you're, with, you're at the supermarket. You are a temple of the Holy Spirit going out into the world. So do not waste that opportunity to show the world and those around you the incredible riches of the God that we know. That all the wrong things that we've done, we no longer have to feel guilt and shame for. And now we have the privilege of being able to, as temples, point to him and show the rest of the world how beautiful he is. Do not forget the meaning of your life. Do not forget how meaningful your story is. You're on a pilgrimage too. You have, you're on your own journey. Do not forget how meaningful it is to be a temple of the Holy Spirit. This plan has been in motion for thousands and thousands of years. It's actually, the Bible even says, is before the foundation of the world, this plan has been in motion to bring you into his family. Do not take it for granted. The last thing I wanna do today is I wanna talk directly to you if you're in this room and you would not claim that Jesus Christ is your savior, meaning that you are in a place where you don't know what you think about all of this. And that's on a spectrum, right? Like you could be in a place where you're here and you're, you're just trying to figure this whole thing out. You're, you're here because you're just trying to figure out what this whole Jesus thing is about. Or you're on the other end of the spectrum. Maybe everything I've said today, you are actively against, and my words might even be making you a little bit angry. And I'm glad if you're here, if that's you, I'm so glad you're here this morning because I want to ask you a simple question. Just entertain with me for a minute that this is our God and he is real and that he not only just is with us during times of pain, but that he understands. He's a God who's empathetic to you. He's a God who has made a way for you. He doesn't just desire for you to be close, but he went out of his way to go that extra mile and make a way for you. And the third, he's a king who follows through on his promises. His words are not empty. He's promised to a way to bring you into his family, and he made that way. If this is true about our God, my final question to you is, why would you not follow him? His love is so good, and he desires for you deeply to be in his family, to come along on your own pilgrimage with him. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for Psalm 132 and what it says about your promise. Thank you so much that you sent Jesus, to be the king who sits on the throne, the promised king. Thank you so much that we no longer have to travel to the temple because we are the temple. Let us go out among 
our people this week that we are in the context of and be the temple to them. Point them to you. Bring your presence with us in the rooms that we enter. I ask God, no matter where we're at on our journey with you, that this week you would just see so, seem so undeniably attractive to give our lives to because we see that you're a God who follows through on his promises and has always desired to make a way. In your name we pray, amen. Thank you all so much for being with us this morning. We have our Bible reading plan. You can access that on the app, website, and digital bulletin. Look for it under Sunday resources. I'm gonna be down here after the service if you'd like to come say hi or ask me any questions. Thank you all so much. Hope you have a great day.